All right, here we go. We have Memphis Rap Royalty in the building. Let's chat. Welcome to Vlad TV. Hey. I knew you was going to just do top ups. I made sure I wore the perfect bra. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Uh, long time fan, by the way. Long time fan. Thank Congrats you, on me having too. Uh, you know classics under your belt. Thank you. I'm a fan of yours too, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's your first time here. I want to start at the very beginning. So you were born and raised in Memphis. Yes, Memphis, Tennessee. Okay. And what was Memphis like in the '80s and '90s? Uh it's like it is now. Hardcore, uh, street, thuggish. We get money down there, though. Don't get it wrong. We get money. We're going to take some money. Not me. I ain't going to take no money. But they're going to get some money. They're going to take some money. And, you know, it's a fun city. It's a fun city. You have to be from there, though, to survive. I feel you. I feel you. Uh, okay, now you talked about how you grew up. You had a good mom uh, and a stepdad. Yeah. My dad, my real dad died when I was 11. He died from cancer. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Rest in peace, Willie. I love you, Dad. <laughs> I mean, I, the relationship between little girls and their dads is so strong. You know, how did it feel to lose your dad at such an early age like that? Well, it, it hurt it because, you know, he really, he was around when I was smaller. But as I got older, I didn't get to see him because I didn't know he was sick. But I always heard people saying, Daddy, Daddy. So, you know... Pretty much every man that my mom was dating, I used to go up to him and say, can I call you daddy? And it's like, yeah, you can call me daddy. And I just wanted to call somebody daddy. And then finally, the one that she did marry, I come up to him and say, can I call you daddy? He say, no. And I said, oh, well, that sucks. So now we stuck with a, a stepdad that we can't call daddy. <laughs> so it hurt me, but look how it turned out. I was all right. But my stepdad, I love him. I got him tatted on me. You know, he raised us real good. I guess he just had to be that way. But we still can't call him dad it is to these days. <laughs> and how many kids were there, like on your mom's side? Uh, it was me and three brothers. One of my brothers got killed in 89. He was 21. He got killed in South Memphis. You know, he's one of them hardcore niggas that you had to kill. You know, so we know how it go. Okay, so if you say 89, was that around the same time that your dad died? Same time. I put it in the rap too, same year. Same time, so it was hard. I lost them both in the same year. So 89 was just an awful year for you. Terrible year. I didn't understand, you know. My brother was only 21 years old for them, my mom to get the call. He laying on the hill dead. But, you know, when he, we went to the courtroom, when they went to the courtroom, they had more people uh, testifying how dangerous he was than on his side. And the guy ended up getting manslaughter. And my brother didn't even have a gun. So, you know, they tell you something about this bloodline. Okay, so you actually had to end up going to court. Well, okay, because the guys who killed him got caught and charged. Yeah, the dude did. Well, I didn't go to court. My mom went. I was, you know, too young to go. My mom went and he kind of broke her heart because... She was like, she didn't understand who they was talking about. When people got up there and said that he was doing this and he was this type of guy. And I think the, the court system hurt my mama stronger than the funeral. Because she like, what? who was y'all talking about? Who's this guy? They made him like he was just a mobster, you know? Just like, you know, I'm a mother. We, don't, we really don't know how our kids is, you know? But she ended up finding out that day that, we went to, that she went to court and hurt her heart. But it did give us some understanding. You know, she came back and told us. I was younger. I didn't understand until I got older. Well, it's one thing to lose uh, a parent, you know, or a sibling. But when a mother loses their child, it's a very unnatural kind of situation. It's something that, that doesn't, isn't supposed to happen that way. No. You know, and you know, as, as a mother. Yeah. How did your mom take losing her son? She had a nervous breakdown, like literally, to the point, you know, she was a sergeant at a correctional facility and she lost her mind. So they had to retire her because she really had a mental breakdown. Yeah, it was odd. 
Yeah, I bet. Yeah, yeah I he bet. was my biggest brother, so it was hard for me too. You know, he always took up for all of us. He taught us what tough was really was. I saw him smack a nigga three times. <laughs> when I was little, my mom used to give us a quarter and tell us go to the store. So I want to go to the store. I'm going to spend my quarter. I'm going to get my little 10 cents, spend my little nail laters, buy me two bag of nail laters. That's 10 to 10 and then five pieces of penny candy. So that's 25 cents. So when we go to the store, we want to say, I remember to do all of they got these little broke ass kids right here. That's all they don't want them but some penny gum and some penny candy. Look at y'all little broke ass. You know, we young, we don't know what's going on. So one day I went to the store with my big brother. I said, dude right there be messing with me, the dude standing up there. He said, who? Who? He be messing with you. I said, yeah, he be messing with you, be messing with me. He said, you be messing with my little sister. Smack, smack, smack. I'm talking about, I ain't never in my life saw nobody get smacked so fast and so hard. I was like, oh. It scared me. The dude just took out running. He was like, yeah, I'll be back. And my brother was like, yeah, I'll be right here. And I'm like, come on, let's go. Let's go. I'm trying to get my brother to go. Now you mad at me. Go on, go on. So, you know, man, from that point on, I got another brother. We just was tough. We was tough. Oh, well, sorry if you're lost. Uh, that's a <laughs> tough one. Yeah, that, thank that's you. That's a tough one. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you had mentioned in some other interviews that you got into the streets around 13 years old? Yep, I was 13. Could have been 12. I was young. <laughs> really come okay. from me being the only girl. I was bored at home. You know, like I said, I never had to be in the streets. I chose the streets. So I always give my mom credit. I don't know what no lights, not having no lights feel like. I don't know what uh, not being hungry feel like. You know, I know about having a life insurance. I, I know how to live. I just chose the streets. I was a boy, little girl. So I jumped off the porch and, you know, got in the streets, hanging out with a, with a dude, which ended up being my baby daddy. And they was just a mess, just a hot goddamn mess. And it just influenced on me and just turned me to a, a good girl gone bad. What did you get into first? Like, what were some of the things that you were, you were starting to do around that age? I was just hanging out and just seeing a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of stuff. A lot, a lot of stuff. Okay. Because you, <laughs> you said, uh, you know, you said you did some hustling. You towed a couple of units. Some of oh, yeah, for used sure. The past. You know, that's one thing about it. You know, me and my baby daddy, we could, we was like Bunny and Clyde. He was the driver. I was the, I was the pistol holder, which I'm licensed to carry, by the way. So that makes me now, you know, from that point on, I always tow pistols. I know how to hide them. I know how to break them down. I know how to load them. You know, my favorite one is a 38, but of course I love a 40 Glock, you know, but a 38 is my favorite, but a 357 too, cause it fit in my little, you know, little smaller size. But yeah, so my baby daddy had me towing the pistol while we was driving here where people didn't know that. So I guess I was gonna have to be the shooter, but really he was gonna be the shooter and I was gonna take the charge. Okay, and during that time, what do you think was the worst situation you got into? Man, the worst situation that I got into, man, I'm trying to think of one that we got caught up in because, you know, <laughs> one thing about it, I don't want to tell what, what we what we didn't get caught doing. So let me see. The worst situation could have been, uh, mm, my, the one that we didn't get caught up in. How about that? <laughs> That's the worst situation. Okay, but there were some bad situations along the way. Man, there were some terrible situations. But they built me to be strong. I tell people all the time, you know. I, I, I make songs about my baby dad. I talk about him. I laugh, play, cry, fight, whatever. But he made me strong, though. Which is weak ass. And I was just playing. <laughs> okay, and, and what age did you get pregnant? Well, I got pregnant when I was 19, thank God. You know, because we were thinking, I'm in the streets. I, I, my mom took me out of school because I wouldn't ever go home. And they called and telling her, like, your daughter not going to school. Your daughter not going to school. So she ended up taking me out of school. She ended up signing over for me to get married at the age of 16. She was like, I'm going to give him to you because he was like 18. He turned 18 and I was 16. So she was like, I'm going to get you out of my cousins. You don't want to go to school and you want to be grown. You want to do what you got to do. 
come on, I'm gonna take y'all down there. Y'all get married. I'm finna give them to you. And I got married when I was 16. Oh, so you actually got married at 16 years old? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are, are you still married? <laughs> no way. <laughs> so, what, <you laughs> well, I'd, be glad, <laughs> I'd be glad I'm still sitting here today and not behind the bars. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so, when did you get divorced? Uh, I got divorced, could have been like, uh, could have been like 21, 21. Okay. Yeah. All right, so five years later. Yeah, five years later. Okay. And w what was the final straw for the divorce? Ah, oh, man, my baby dad was terrible. He, oh, oh, Lord, he just was terrible. He knew it. He just didn't even care. So I ain't, oh, it just was the final straw. I, I was just fed up. It was just over. <laughs> but I love them, though. We best of friends now. So, you know, I don't want to be like I'm bashing them because one thing about it, we're going to ever be family because we got a child. You know, I don't understand these women or these men that get mad because baby mamas and baby daddies still got relationships. When we blood just by their child, you know what I'm saying? I don't want nothing to happen to my baby daddy because then my son ain't got a father. He won't want nothing to happen to me because then his son ain't got a mother. I trust him more than I trust a new nigga or any nigga that I fuck with because we got something they got the same blood together. So, you know, we gonna always be 100. So I can't come out here and bash him, but his ass know he did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and you have a, a son together. Is that your only child? Yeah, it's my only child. Yeah. Okay. I'm an only child too, so I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, you know, one thing, you know, DJ Paul is actually a, a friend of mine. And, uh, you know, we talk on a regular basis and we've done a lot of interviews together. One thing he said in one of our interviews, which I found very interesting, is that he said that Memphis has a dark energy. Would you agree? Yeah, I agree. I agree for some reason. I don't know why Memphis got a dark energy. It's like, even if you really, you can't really just, you can, if you got some money, you really just can't show it because the nigga go hate on you. They just hate on you for no reason. Bitches go hate on you for no reason. That's dog to me. You know what I'm saying? They won't allow you to be who you really are. So, you know, I got to, when people see me, I love walking around being normal. I never been a stunner. I never been a flasher. They call sure, I know how to move. I want to survive out here. I'm, I, know, I know how to move out here. You know, but I don't know why Memphis just a hating city. We love, but we hate. Hate mine, hate they ass out. They hate on nigga got the nigga got the new J's last Saturday. Like, come on, bro, man, down here you can have these joints. Gone. <laughs> For real. <laughs> okay, so you're growing up in Memphis, and I guess right around the third grade, uh, that's when you started rapping in a way from a poem that you did? Yeah, I did a poem, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, matter of fact, my uh, brother. Older brother, we, what it was, it was Black History Month. And then my older brother said, well, why don't you write a rap? And I was like, the one that's dead. I said, I don't know how to rap. He said, I'm going to help you write a rap. And he helped me write a rap. You want to hear it? You like hear this. It? Dr. Martin Luther King, this very day, all the people just love him for what he say. And whatever he say, he says it out loud. His voice, you know, just draws a crowd. See, it all started out not long ago. Dr. Martin Luther King, you was a kid, you didn't know. He had a dream, and his dream came true. He was fighting for the rights for me and you. He got bottles and bricks thrown in his face. But Dr. Martin Luther King never ran away. He's the greatest of the greatest. He's the king of all. He's Dr. Martin Luther King, standing brave and tall. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there and we from go. That point on, I thought I was a rapper. Okay. And was your original name LeChat or something else? No, I called myself Octomo first. And then I called myself Cha Cha. And then I came up with LeChat. Okay. And why LeChat? <laughs> I don't know. To be honest, I know my name Chastity. And I just started calling myself Lil Chat, but it was so many Lil's, L-I-L's out here. You know, you had the Lil Kims and Lil everybody. So I just said, I'm going to be different. And I call it L-A with the hyphen, C-H-A-T, still pronounced the same, you know, and I came up with it. Okay. So 
you continue to kind of hone your rapping. And then I guess there was a, a talent show in the ninth grade. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I really was at summer school when I bumped into Illinois. They were talking about, yeah. little, that's who introduced me to Juicy. Yeah, because right. I, I was always telling them I can rap, I can rap. Like, man, you can't rap, you can't rap. Like, yes, I can. So we did the little talent show, you know. He rapped, I rapped. Then after that, we ended up rapping against each other. Then he was like, man, you can rap for real. I'm going to get Juicy your number. And I didn't think he was going to get to him, but he ended up giving Juicy the number. I didn't think Juicy was going to call, but Juicy ended up calling him. Okay, and he called and he wanted you to rap right there on the spot. Yeah, on the spot. I'm like, <laughs> uh, my mama here, like, what's up, what's up, what's up? This Juicy, what's up? I heard you can rap. I'm like, uh, yeah, I can rap. He's like, let me hear something. I'm like, uh, my mama in the room, we like, oh, okay, then, well, I thought you wanted to rap being hung up. I said, oh, man, I missed my chance. So he called back like 12 o'clock midnight. He was like, hey, how you doing, what's up? This Jordan. I was like, Jordan, because, you know, I ain't know the, the Jordan and, all that, but I know they was the hottest in the streets. He's like, yeah, I heard you can rap. He's like, I heard you, you know, let me hear something. I went outside at the end of the driveway, and I rapped. He said, oh, you can rap. You, you bump. He said, I want to get you on the album. I said, okay. So he came, and uh, came with the little two-play record thing. You know, you hit the play and record, the thing with the little cassette, and a little microphone, one of my homegirls' living room, and I rapped, and this, you know, it came out. And I was like, people like, chat rapping, chat rapping. And I thought I was a rapper then too. Okay, so so Juicy reached out to you, then what, he brought you to the studio? No, uh-uh, he came, he asked me where to come. We went to one of my homegirls' house. And he came uh -huh. to our living room with the little uh, cassette player thing that you hear oh. record and play to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to record with the microphone <laughs> and the headphones. So we standing up and... He, I'm talking about, they was real grounders then. I'm talking about, they was dropping tapes like every week, every week. Him, DJ Paul, DJ Squeaky, DJ Zerk, uh, Criminal Mind, ooh, Spanish Fly. I'm talking about, they had Memphis on lock. They, they some bad influence too. There are a lot of reasons why Memphis so dark too now. They need to take their charge. Don't get on here talking about Memphis dog. Y'all know what y'all talking about. Lock them in the trunk, throw them in the river. Uh, okay, so so I guess you went out of town after that, and then Three Six Mafia signed their deal with R Relativity. Well, I really didn't go out of town. I just was in the streets, you know. I still was just I really wasn't taking rap serious, you know. And Juicy be like, "Well, we working on uh Mr. Styles. We doing this, we doing that." And I was like, "Okay, well, I call Mr. Styles the end of it." And then after that, I still was hanging, you know. Like I said, a good girl gone bad. And I'm looking on the news. These folks just signed a big major deal. I'm like, oh, this is my group. <laughs> my group on TV. I'm sitting up here with you. There's something baby down here with you. <laughs> so, like, I done missed my chance. But, uh, my, they were showing out. They were doing uh, Tell the Club up. And they came out with the album. And I kept on rapping. You know, uh, I bumped into my cousin, DJ Gang Gang, and Big Pat from Lamar Terry. Lamar Terry, shout out them. They ended up putting out the album called, not they put it out later but it was called ultimate revenge but it really wasn't original called it but they started recording me and juicing them got hold of the album and they ended up calling me i was a manager i was working at disc queen one thing about me i'm gonna give me some money any means necessary i don't care everybody already know i'm gonna work a job i'm a hustle i'm gonna do anything but take some money that's for sure i'm gonna give me some money so i was working at uh disc queen i was a manager by the way and uh, I'm going to be big, 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 big in it. Remember that? <laughs> so uh, I was a manager, and they called, and it was like, uh, Chad, we got hold of your album. Man, we want you back. I was like, you want me back? Like, yeah, we want you back. I was like, okay. He said, can you come to the studio tonight? Like, yeah. He said, okay, well, hey, hey, y'all, I'm going to get Chad to come down here. Y'all want some food? <laughs> like, yeah, like, yeah, he wants some food. He didn't fall down a whole list. I'm like, <laughs> so now I got to bring food to the studio because I'm a manager at this quick. It might be my first time coming back around. I got a whole list of, of, of combos and everything, but I bought them. And we came down there and I dropped hoes can be like niggas. And they was like, mine. Okay. Now, the body, body Full of Bullet Holes, was that the song that was recorded on the cassette tape? Yeah, Body Full of Bullet Holes. It was me, okay. him, and, now, and Crunchy. 
and Crunchy Black. Right. You talk about you're the one that doesn't steal or take. Crunchy's the one that does. Yeah, that's Crunchy. Yeah, I <laughs> rob. Mr. Yeah, I rob. Yeah, I steal. That's him. <laughs> that guy. Right. Who's also a regular guest on Vlad TV, by the yeah, way. Yeah, shout out Crunchy, man. Shout out Crunchy. <laughs> okay. So, so you showed up on that. And then you showed up on Mystic Styles. Well, we did Mystic Styles first. And then they yeah. got signed. I was still beside my baby daddy looking like, you know, nobody. They were signed all uh-huh. on the news getting some money. Then after that, I started rapping again, you know, with my little, with my cousin them. They got to put money behind me. And still going on Beer Street, still trying to keep my name out. And just never heard it. And then right. that's and when showed, we did the uh, hypnotized count when he called me to come back. Right. And you were on a uh, touch with it. Nah, I was nah. on a uh, hypnotized count album. Bullet holes is way back. Before. No, no. But the song touched with it with uh, uh, with Mr. Servon, Fiend and you. Oh, that's the name I look. They had us doing so many songs. I don't even know the names of them. Oh, OK. Got it. <laughs> We did Got so it. many songs. I don't know the name of them. Right. And, you know, what's interesting about you is that, um, I mean, apart from, you know, Project Pat, who is obviously, you know, related to, to Juicy J, you were the only person that DJ Paul didn't bring in. Pretty much everyone else were, was DJ Paul's people. But you you came in through Juicy. Yeah, I came in through Juicy. So yep. I was a Juicy rapper. So if y'all right. gonna get his like DJ uh Juicy, what was it? It's Juicy J7. Y'all notice I'm all through there. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and when you talk about the three six mafia, you know, people were talking about smoking weed and everything back then, but but three six mafia were the, the first ones to really talk about doing hard drugs, cocaine, syrup, like codeine. And I mean, really, really they kind of established uh a pathway that other people did later on. I mean, how did you feel about that type of subject matter? Here you are, still a teenager. Well, you know, I ended up finding out that what was going on. You know, like people going, they were doing sipping on their scissors, and people didn't know when they were hollering, everybody get your roll on, they talking about pills, you know. People didn't know, you know, but it was fun times though. So it didn't bother me. Yeah, well, you know, you mentioned, you know, sipping on scissor which, you know, 3-6 Mafia and UGK did, uh, which was one of my favorite songs from both groups. It might be my favorite song from both groups, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I'm a fan of both. And, uh, and you were actually there for the music video and everything, right? Yeah, that's when I first met PMC and Bun B at the video shoot. Ah, yeah, I know Bun pretty well. Uh, I got to hang out with Pimp C one time, maybe two weeks before he died. And it was just like... It was something you never forget hanging out with Pimp C. That's the one thing. You you was just meeting him? (laughs) Yeah, I just met him. You missed some wonderful years then. So you met the the new pimp. You ain't get to meet the the pimp, pimp there. Woo! Pimp crazy. He he was he was crazy and he never stopped talking. I remember it was like story after story after story. He now, was just the center of the room. Uh, so much personality. We were actually supposed to do an interview, but he didn't have his haircut, so he didn't want to he didn't want to do it that day. So uh, mm. I missed my opportunity. And then he passed um, a couple of weeks later. Man, his manager was a friend of mine also. Yeah, that I remember uh, we was at a club in Atlanta, and it was like a whole lot of us there. I think it was like uh, Criminal Mind, them squeaky. Uh, Pimp C and it was some old little rappers that was there too and Pimp C he was just talking shit yeah mighty fucking fuck nigga mighty fuck boys mighty niggas they, all, they be hating man. they don't know nothing about getting no real money so we just okay we, everybody we still drinking and, and smoking and doing what we do he just calling us down on such yeah I'm telling I'm fucking around and smack one of these niggas man these niggas need to find us somebody to play with so we like okay so we still thinking you know everything cool so we walked out, someone in the rappers come over and tell her, man, fuck that nigga, man. That nigga talking about me. I'm like, oh, we like, why a minute? <laughs> we thought y'all kind together. I did come with him, but then man talking about me. I'm like, I'm talking about, man, you, you, you got to know the new pimp. Man, you missed the damn fool. <laughs> you missed the damn fool. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, man. I, I'm still I'm still disappointed that I didn't get to actually sit down with him and do the proper interview, man. Uh, I, was, I was such a fan, like I was such a fan of, of him, you know. That, yeah. That sad. Yeah. Well, then 2001 comes around, 
and Project Pat is putting together Chicken Head. Yes. You jump on that song. Right. Didn't know it was going to be as big as it is today. Well, it's your biggest song ever. Ever. Ever, ever. in life. It really was like the first al- first song to go platinum. You know, mm. the first song to be played on, uh, the first video to be played on MTV. You know, it was a big, big, big song. Yeah, I mean, and a great song at that. Um, and I guess the song sort of came together by you guys writing in a separate rooms and kind of just trying to diss each other? Yeah, he got me to my chat. I got this song, it's called Chicken Head. I want you to roast me on it. He like, man, just talk bad about me. I was like, okay, so you know, I went in the room. I don't know what he finna say. He don't know what I finna say. So like I said, I'm thinking of all the stuff to say about these niggas out here like, yeah, because they always be talking about, yeah, you, yeah, little mama like your outfit, but... I said, these dudes, they gas ain't be on E shoes, don't even be fresh. But y'all try to talk to somebody. Y'all need to get y'all self together first. So I'm ready. That's my title. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. So I go drop mine. He come in, laugh, like, man, Chad, you roast me, man. But I ain't know what he gonna say. He come back and roast me. And we still did not have a clue that it was gonna be this big. Didn't have a clue. Right. He starts off with bald head scallywag and got no hair in back gelled up <laughs> weaved up your hair is messed up like <laughs> when you first heard that were you like mad a little bit or now, i was laughing i was laughing because i know he ain't talking about me he's talking about her well we, we, we at the time you know we good at that we go diss the people that we with on the slick down you know the world don't know but it be true we dissing you sitting right here beside me <laughs> so it was funny to me Okay, and and the the boy please whatever like that's being used throughout the whole song. Yeah, like like whose idea was it to keep repeating it like that? Well, I said it, and uh, they took it, and you know how they do. They made it creative, and they put it all through the song. But I said it, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, no. The way the way they use that, who who produced it? Was that uh, Juicy or, or Paul? I think both of them, to be honest, because they used to work on mm-hmm. beats together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, but by putting that in there, I feel like that really just kind of made the song because you kind of had that catchy kind of, yeah, you know, over and over again. Yeah, that, uh, that little oh, okay. Memphis song and, I still say that today. Boy, please, what else? <laughs> <laughs> right, and then and then you guys do the video, which is a pretty high budget video at that. Yeah, right, and and from that video, the meme li- years later has occurred. Where, you know, when they have you in the car kind of bobbing your head back and forth, like I always see that. We're actually going to show it on the screen right now. And the crazy part about it, that's something that we all do in Memphis. That's what we do. You know, we flick on somebody. You know, we be on Beer Street or if we see somebody, we clean, we swerve in front of them, then we give them a look. Then we just swerve on again and then we give this person a look. You know, that's what we do. That's a Memphis look. <laughs> call it Memphis swerve. That's what we're going to call it. Mm. Swerve on them. Swerve on them. <laughs> okay, and and that song came out, and you're still working a job at the time. Yeah, I'm still working a job, still getting my coins now. So they can't keep me from that. But they end up keeping me from because they holding my line up. They got to hold my drive through line up. Somebody want to see the rapper girl. I'm the manager. I'm like, look, these folks need to come on now. Y'all need to get these burgers out. Get them out. <laughs> so here they come, they want to flood the dining room. We here to see Lil Chad. We here to tell her, oh, Lord, Jesus. Come on, man, get your burgers out and go on, keep on. To the point I had to quit. I was mad as a motherfucker. I was mad that I had to quit. Keep in mind, I'm the manager. So I'm getting my money with the rap shit. So, you know, they kept holding my line up, kept flooding my dining room. I said, fuck it. So, you know, Juice was glad I quit, though. He had already kind of told me before, my chat, I want you to cut out everything you're doing. Everything. Because like I said, I still was in the streets. You know, I come make a little free place here and there. He's be like, you finna be big. He like, man, people like slip and slag asking about you, man. So many people asking about you. He like, I just want you to cut out whatever you're doing. <laughs> so Juice was glad I quit, really. Well, years later, Cardi B redid the song, called it Bickin' Head. Yeah. And uh, you felt some type of way about it. I really didn't. You know, but since they had to who run it challenge out, it just gave me a subject. You know what I'm saying? They had to run it challenge. Everybody was saying, chat, you know, do the challenge. I'm like, okay, well, I can't do it because who run it? You know what I'm saying? So it gave me a subject because it is what it is. The song is what it is. 
It's facts, you know. I I ain't did nothing. I won't bother nobody. I'm at home, probably writing another rap for somebody else writing some more words that somebody can say. That's one thing about it, you know. This little this little head got some big ideas, you know. I'm the underdog, but people be looking at me and they be taking my ideas and doing good things. But you know, it'd be a compliment to me. Well, I guess you had mentioned that, you know, you had expected Cardi to kind of shout you out or mention you at some point in the song. Well, she could have. She could have reached out or could have said, you know, shout out, because I did see that she thanked, you know, everybody except me. So I'm like, damn, come on now, we bitches, what we doing? You know, you got to thank you, Project Bad, thank you, Juicy J, thank you, DJ Paul, like another motherfucker went on it. So I just felt like, you know, it is what it is, that's how it go. I know women, a lot of women that way, but if it was me and I was her, you know, I would have been like, you know, shout out Cardi B. It ain't nothing. It ain't like I said she should have paid me. You know what I'm saying? So I guess I I guess I was the one that they didn't want to get noticed. So shout out everybody except the one who say, boy, please, whatever. Mm. Well, uh, that same year, the Baby Mama song came out. Mm. Uh, another big song for you. Very big. And that had the, the ye note, which kept getting used throughout throughout yeah. the song. So it was almost like the same type of like, you know, the chat is the girl that's great to throw out the phrase that we can keep using throughout the song. <laughs> yeah. With the Memphis line, that's another Memphis word. You ain't know. So, you know, I said it. They put it through the song. It got in the Baby Boy movie. We all premiered that. It was great. I mean, everybody that was in the movie. We had a good time. Right. <laughs> Right, I guess uh, you would go hang out in, in Memphis movie theaters and, and wait until that part of the song, that yeah. part of the movie came out with your song. <laughs> ah, so you've been doing your research, huh? <laughs> that's, that's what I do. That's what I yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. I use my. I know I went to the uh, movies at least about five, six times that day. That one day, and I ain't know I was in. I'm just waiting, waiting. And every time my pod came on, the the auditorium go, yeah, ooh, and I'm just sitting there like. <laughs> You know, I never experienced it. I never felt it before. And it was a great feeling. I am walking out like this. Then I like, we gotta go to another one. We gotta go to another movie theater. We gotta go to another one. We got to about we went to every movie theater in Memphis that one day. I just had to hear it on some way. They got, yeah. I'm like, yeah. Okay, and I think uh two-way freak came out right around the same time. Yeah, two-way freak came out. And that's the time when Paul and them just made me put on so much makeup, I hated it. Like, Chad, you gotta wear makeup. Everybody wear makeup. I said, this, yeah, I look like a monster. <laughs> so everybody gonna look at Two Way Freak. I don't know who that person was. <laughs> but Two Way Freak was a hard song because everybody was wearing two ways back then. If people don't know, you know, you had the beepers, then you got the two ways. We thought it was gonna last longer than what they lasted, but mine is two ways. <laughs> Right. Well, it was the original text messages. I remember when uh when we met John Singleton for the Baby Mama video, and John Singleton used to always hit me up on my two way, and Juice used to be like, "Chat, you got John Singleton on your two way. John Singleton ain't even on my two way." <laughs> so he like, "Man, damn girl." <laughs> so yeah, them two ways was lit. Rest in peace, John Singleton, too, man. <laughs> yeah, rest in peace, John Singleton, uh, absolute legend in the, in the movie business. Uh, well, the one thing that was really noticeable about you during this era was that you never really pushed the sexuality, you know, whereas you had the little Kims and the Foxy Browns that'd be almost naked in their videos and, you know, the little Kim would have the titty out, you know, <laughs> on the red carpet and so forth. You, you, you pretty much wore big shirts, baggy clothes, uh, nothing tight. I mean, you're you're basically dressed way more like yeah. No, I was just gonna say this really too much. I guess. This really too much for me, you know. But shout out my stylist, uh, Maisha girl. Shout out Maisha, y'all give give it up for. She always want me to do something different. This too much though. But yeah, you know, uh, really, I really even though I had my thug image anyway, I think just know they pretty much wanted me to stick with it. You know what I'm saying, like. Even if I wanted to wear, we can be at like the the freak freak uh freak nicks and the little whatever it is that we had going on for the summer. And I come down, I feel like since then I, I ain't a show, I can come down in my little shorts or whatever. Just be like, check, go back upstairs. 
I'm like, what? He <laughs> like, go back upstairs. Go change your clothes. Go change my clothes. Hey, look, you got to be chatting at all times. You got to be chatting at all times. Like, man, go up there, change clothes, come back down. It came to the point that they just started buying my clothes. They were like, you know what? We just go buy some. My mother, she spoke out. They come with the big icebergs, uh, sweater in the ass. They like, we just go buy your clothes. You can see on chicken heads, the clothes was way too big. Huge. But they did it, and I, I, I appreciate them for it because they wanted to make sure that I stayed in my lane. You know, even though I was the thuggish on stage, they wanted me to be thuggish at all times. They didn't, I remember, uh, funny story, we was at Gaveston. Just said, uh, we had so many people on the car. We had uh, an artist, I don't want to say name. We had an artist, and I was just going crazy. Ooh, they been to come up. Oh, we been to come up. He said, oh. Come on, y'all, time to go, time to go. Chat going crazy because uh, such and such finna go up. I'm like, I'm just thinking that he's just playing. They said, no, we going to the bus for real. I'm like, wait a minute, we finna go? He said, oh, yeah, we finna go. We getting the bus, I'm mad. He like, yeah, we finna go. He said, come and tell you something. You don't be a fan of nobody. You make them your fans. And I said, from that day on, I walked in the room like I was the headliner. I wasn't a fan of nobody. I made them my fans. So, you know, they taught us some good things along with the bad things. <laughs> but they taught us some good things too. Well, the other noticeable thing around that time was the gold teeth. Now, were those permanent golds they, or? They are. They permanent. They can't come out. They permanent. I get them redone. And uh, I'm thinking about getting some diamonds in them, but for what? I thought about it for a minute, then I said, God damn it, for what? Why? God damn, I get 43 years old now. I want to throw some goddamn diamonds in my mouth. Hell no. <laughs> so, other than that, you know, it is what it is. So, I'm the first female rapper to have a mouth full of gold teeth. Bling. Permanence. This is true. You actually <laughs> are, yeah. Now, now that I'm thinking about it, you were the first female rapper to have permanent gold teeth. You're right. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yeah. There you have it. Trendsetter. Yeah. Trendsetter. Okay. So then, th then your album come up, comes out. Murder, She Spoke. Murder, She Spoke. And that actually debuted se number 78 on the Billboard charts. Man, it, it surprised me. So, I mean, it wasn't top 10, but, but still, though. I mean, still, because you're talking about out of all the albums to come out in the country. This is the main Billboard charts, not the rap charts or the R&B charts. This is the actual main Billboard 200. You were 78 and on then that. I think I was How independent, too. You know, I once signed with uh, Sony. Mm, and, right. You know, I was just up under the hypnotized mind and uh, the college, they was independent. But right after uh, Emergency Spoke dropped, the next week, Choices dropped. So I had a lot of comp competition. So I did damn good, you know. <laughs> we doing little chat autograph signing and choices signing at the same time. So it worked out real well. Okay, so, so things are going well. You know, you're on big songs, you're doing music videos, your debut album does great for an independent album. You know, you're on choices. And then things seem to kind of go downhill. You know, there was an interview on... Uh, we eat so many shrimp <laughs> blog that said, um, well, you said what happened was my album murder. She spoke dropped. And I sold 250,000 copies and just never saw any roy royalties from it. I never saw a royalty check period. Yeah, that's true. You know, I was getting so many shows and I remember Paul telling me, he was like, my chat, you know, you say over hundred thousand copies, you're going to be good, which I sold over hundred thousand copies. And, uh, I was getting plenty, plenty, plenty of shows. So, it really wasn't a money thing. That's why, like I said, I was young at the time. And I really, I'm looking for a check. I'm like, what a mercy spoke check because I'm knowing this more money that I could have been getting. So it wasn't like that I got went broke or nothing and then started asking for checks. I was asking for checks because I know this album was selling. And I know I'm on the road three, four times a week. So I'm like, this show money, you know, where the, where the check money is. So, you know, Juice was like, well, you know, check, you know, we don't know. You gotta, College, you know, gotta get over college. So I was like, okay, so I need to do. He was like, I don't know, get a lawyer. I was like, okay, but you know, we joke so much, we laughing, but I'm, I'm taking it for real. I got a lawyer. 
not knowing that the lawyer was going to tell me, you know, I can't be in contact with them and uh, we got to solve this matter. You know, don't contact me until we find out who went fault. I'm like, what? You know, they called Juice Powell, called me like, check, we got a, lawyer, a letter from your lawyer. Told us, you know, not to contact you. They're trying to see what's going on with the money or whatever. And I was like, huh? So I didn't keep in mind I'm young. So I didn't ever read the letter that he sent out. He just told me, okay, we go send this letter out and we go get your money. That's all he said. So we ain't knowing that I'm going to have to be like, you know, we criminal victims and got to stay in protective custody and don't see me, don't say nothing to me type shit. I ain't have a clue. So when that happened, I was like, damn, man, you know, I was sick. I was sick. I wasn't even sick about the money. I was sick of the relationship. I was sick from the bond that we had. I was sick from, we had been through so much together. You know, these people brought me into the industry and the money really wanted, to be honest, wasn't even more important than our friendship. You know what I'm saying? Because they were like, I didn't go broke and start asking about the checks. I just asked about the checks because I knew I was supposed to have checks. So it really made me feel like a, a girl going through a heartbreak because I was on tour with these guys. You know, I woke up to these guys. I went to sleep to these guys. We, you know, we was in big club balls and we did so much stuff together. We was at the studios Monday through Monday. You know, they really was my life. People, I was, they took me away from the streets. I go right to these days, people like, chat, you know, so, so, I don't know nobody. I was locked in the studio, you know, just because I'm a hood girl. I don't know niggas from the hood. I don't know bitches from the hood because I was locked in the studio. So it hurted me. You know, I was like, damn. And then, uh, you know, I was still held up so I couldn't move because I'm still on paperwork with him. And Paul was just like, you know what, chat, I'm going to let you go. You want to get let go, I'm going to let you go because, you know, we still had the matter. They couldn't get it solved. I was just like, forget it. I can't do it. Because Juicy called and was like, Chad, we're going to do your other album, but by you can't be around us, you got to do that in another studio. So I'm feeling some type of way. I'm in my feelings. Like, nah, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Let's just don't do it at all then. Because I'm still hurt. I'm like, nah, I'm not going to do this. I'm like, fuck the, fuck the law, fuck this. But, you know, they business me, so they didn't want to follow the rules. They, it's not that they didn't want to fuck with me. They just wanted to do the album and follow the rules at the same time. So I like, just, nah, just let me go. And Paul was like, Chat, you want to be let go? I'm going to let you go. He said, because I love you. He said, I like you. Matter of fact, I love you. He said, but you're going to regret that you stayed, that you didn't stay. And he let me go. And God damn it, I did find out the hard way. <laughs> it wasn't as easy as it looked. You know, like I said before, you get with these people, be glad if you got somebody investing in you, be glad if you got somebody signing you, because they paying for the studio times. Keep in mind, Paul, them, they making the beats. They um buying the clothes. They getting the big budgets from the, the companies. They putting everything in play. I don't think we doing showing up with our little notebooks and writing raps. That's it. Having fun, tripping and laughing. But they making the big plays. And once I was let go from them, you know, it was over. I just had to go and take my little hustle, little money, and keep on grinding. I'm a hustler now, so I know what to do. I know how to do it. Like I said, I know how to get some money. I ain't going to take none, but I know how to get some money. So I just grind it up and I believe in myself and I still believe in myself today. So I take my money and I put it in, you know, put it behind what I believe in, which is me. So they did teach me that. I just took what they showed me and I've been running with it. And yeah, y'all might don't see me on BT, MTV, but y'all be amazed how much big money this little faces and the other little faces be making behind closed doors. Now nah, our work ain't got to be seen. Just know we working. Be amazed. So did you end up suing DJ Paul and Juicy J at one point? Uh-uh, no, I didn't. That's why I said once I got the lawyer and once I found out how he did the letter, which I didn't know that he was going to send a letter out like that, you know, I was upset. I was mad. I, I wasn't going with the move the lawyer was trying to do. Now I'm mad at the lawyer. Like, what the hell? That ain't what you said. You said you're going to get my money. He ain't say you're going to take me from my family. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So we just end up saying, you know, just to get out of it, I end up being mad at the lawyer. And I had to tell, you know, Paul, you know, just go and let me go because I was tired of it. I was still held up because I'm still signed to him, so I still couldn't move. I'm just sitting here, and then the lawyer, I don't know what the hell he did or what the hell he called himself doing and why he did it that way, but he done it, and I just said, forget it. I dropped the case with him, and I just had to go and grind up and to go and come out and be checked.
Okay, and right, and and in that same interview, which is in in two thousand twelve, you said that you don't talk to at that time. You weren't talking to Paul or Juicy at all. So, like when you left, it seemed like you guys really just completely stopped talking. Yeah, they got uh, yeah completely stopped. They were say he said, "Chad, I like you." As a matter of fact, I love you. I'm gonna let you go, but you're gonna regret that you didn't stay with us. And he let me go, you know. And I had to be like a duck that, you know, a bird, a kick that baby duck out the nest. I had to learn how to walk and crawl. And you best believe you see me. I'm walking in and crawling. So I don't regret now and day. Well, did you sign a Yo Gotti at one point? No, I didn't sign with Yo Gotti. We had a 50 50 joint deal going on. And we came out with an album called Bad okay. Influence to Selecto. Right. And I remember you showed up on the song, uh, Shorty Violating. Yeah, Whoop That Out. Whoop That Out. That was a big song, too. Everybody think that's my song. <laughs> yeah. Right. But you were on it. You were mm -hmm. on it. Now, now, there was a rumor I heard that you end up suing Yo Gotti. No, I ain't end up suing Yo Gotti. I just end up. The same way we doing the fifty fifty deal, you know, we was doing it through Selecto, and at the time, the things that he said that he was gonna do, I had no time to be waiting if it didn't get done in a certain amount of time that you said it was gonna do it. I'm not gonna be stalling. I ain't gonna, cause I'm a big dog at this point now. I ain't got to be in the nest no more. So I felt like, you know, if you ain't gonna do, it, if it didn't get done when you said you were gonna do it, let's cut it. Let's cut it right now. And we ain't finna go through these years, we ain't finna go through these months. This is supposed to be done. This is what we said we were gonna do, it didn't get done. So let's cut it. And that's how it was. Okay. <laughs> okay. And you know, you know, when you fast forward to, you know, to 2021, and you look at, for example, Memphis and the rap scene in Memphis. You know, you still have rappers beefing with each other. You know, the Yo Gotti, Young Dolph beat with everyone sort of beef uh, with everyone associated with them chiming in and getting involved and the violence and the, and the shootings and everything. You know, what is your take on that? Why do you think that happens so much in Memphis? Because once again, Memphis got dog energy. It goes back to that. You know, I, I hate that, that Memphis like that because if we all come together, we all can get a whole lot, a lot of money. But that's just how it is. That's just Memphis for you. ain't even the rappers. You gonna have the, the, the club owners into it beefing. You gonna have the, uh, the drug dealers beefing. You gonna have the, the, the beauticians beefing. That's just how they hear. Memphis think it's competition. And we the competition. It ain't nobody but us. Come on now, everybody wanna be us, wanna do what we doing. So I don't see what we competing for. They think it's about competition. And we all winning down there. Yeah, it's too bad. It's too bad. When I, when I hear about these stories coming out of Memphis and you got so much talent coming out of it, and if everyone just worked together, like in Atlanta, for example, you know, out in Atlanta, no one really beefs with each other. Everyone's promoting each other when someone drops. Everyone's getting on each other's albums mm -hmm. and songs and everything else like that. Uh, Memphis isn't really like that. Right, not at all. I wish they was, though. <laughs> I wish they would. We'd be so yeah. on. We'd be more on, put it that way. Because everybody on in their own way. And I own is a Memphis where it um, mean that you doing good. You ain't asking nobody for shit. You standing on your own ten toes. So, 2013, Lord Infamous passes away. Yeah. How close were you guys? Real close. So, if 2013 was the year that he passed away, that was during the time the Mafia Six was being created. Because that's what it was, you know. Lord was so happy. Looked like he was waiting on everybody to get back together to go. <laughs> you know, he was so happy that everybody got back together and we was all back working. And it wasn't long after that that he passed. We was real, real close, man. Lord, Lord is crazy. <laughs> Lord, crazy. Right, and I got to tell the story. I got to tell the story. Computer, go, <laughs> matter of fact, I did see the text. Computer, computer, that text was what that chat called me this computer. No, I'm not, because I know you probably going to get on me. For telling the story, but I got to tell the story. I got to tell it on every interview that I do, cause Lord is crazy. Okay, one time we had, uh we was out of town, we had a show, and Caprita ended up leaving his door halfway open. 
He thought he calls it, but he didn't. So Lord, like, chat, come on, we finna go back in the computer room. We finna go back in the computer room. I was like, okay, let's go. So we get down there. I'm talking about Lord and just trashed his room and took his clothes, threw him in the tub, wet him up, knocked his lamps over, took all his blankets off the bed, just, ooh, trashed it. So at this point, we laughing. We just ran up out the room. Computer come back in his room like, What's going on? We don't, we ain't knowing that the backstory. We just tripped. We somewhere laughing. So the next day we get back on the bus, the tour bus, and they holler, y'all ain't gonna believe this. Like what? Somebody broke the computer room. Like somebody broke the computer room. Like yeah, now they 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 trashed it. We had to give them another room, and I think they did a, a police report or something because you know they think that this one somebody was looking for some money the way it got ramshacked. Lord laughing so hard. He just. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I was like, Lord, be quiet, be quiet. Like, I got to tell him, Chad. I got to tell him. Like, no, no, no. He all, it was me and Chad. I'm like, oh. <laughs> so they're like, what? What? It was all. They laughed for a minute. Then I did. They got to say, come on now. Y'all know y'all around. We got fine and everything. I was like, mine. So I knew then I couldn't be a child partner because he would go tell it. <laughs> Lord crazy. And he, I, one thing about Lord well, too, I remember, he ain't uh, take nobody's side. I'm talking about, he ain't take nobody's side, even though Paul, his family, you know, he just was, if somebody, he like, now Chad, you know, if you did this, or uh, Coop, Coop, now you did say this about Crunchy, you did, so he was kind of just like the, the, the in the middle guy that loved everybody, pretty much like me. You know, I ain't taking nobody's side. I love them all the same. Mm. <laughs> Well, I remember I interviewed Gangster Boo uh, a while back, and I remember Migos were, were real hot at the time. I mean, they still are, but at the time, you know, they were kind of still building up. And everyone was talking about how similar their flow was to Three Six Mafias. And I remember she pointed out, she said, well, that's actually a Lord Infamous flow that they're kind of using. 2 Chain says, this flow came from Drizzy. He got it from Migos. They got it from 3-6. Yeah, dude. I will 100% shout out Skinny Pimp, Lord Infamous. Um, for me, growing up in Memphis, for me, mm -hmm. first hearing the triplet rap, I would have to say that's from Memphis. Yeah. Okay. Because Atlanta, um, Memphis influenced Atlanta music a lot outside of like the Goody Mobs and the Outkast. Mm -hmm. because they had their own sound anyway. But everybody else outside of that, and even them, they were diehard 3-6 Mafia fans. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, because Lord got his own flow. Lord got a flow, did I don't even know how he even come up with it. I'm talking about he been doing this ever since he was, I don't, I don't know how old, really, really, but I know 12, or 13. Like, he always rapped a credible style, that how he do it, how he done it, I don't know. I told the story once before, I'm gonna tell it again. I accidentally picked up his folder, we in the studio. I accidentally picked up his folder, and I'm trying to read, I'm thinking it's mine. I get back and I look at it like, this ain't my folder. I'm trying to read, it look like some zigzag, like some scribble scrabble, like for real, for real. And he like, check, you got my folder? I'm like, this your folder? Cause dog, he ain't gonna say Lord him. <laughs> I'm like, this your folder? He like, yeah, give my folder, check. So, I gave him his phone, I dropped my rap. I came out, sat down, because I wanted to hear what he been to say. My Lord came back there, my, he bumped so hard. He bumped super hard. I'm like, how did you know that this this? How did you know this what you wrote? I'm talking about, then when he come out, he be sweating. <laughs> I'm talking about, he love music, he love rap. I'm talking about, he love it, and he's very creative. He just going to, what do you call himself? Uh, Kaiser Souls, where he got, he goes to a whole other person. I'm talking about, and enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, rest in peace. Rest in peace, Rest Lord in Infamous. peace, Lord. Um, rest in peace, then, Coop, too. Well, yeah, and I was going to mention in 2015, Coopster died. Yeah, Coopster ended up having an aneurysm, and uh, we got the phone call that he was on a breathing machine, and, you know, he wasn't doing good. So they called us all in. We all was there. Paul flew in. And we pretty much watched him took his last breath. You know, we stood over him. And all of us just standing there. And they took the, the machine off of him. He breathed a minute for his, you know, 
for a little bit, and then it was over. And we couldn't believe it. So my coop was healthy. So uh, we don't know where the aneurysm, the aneurysm come out of anywhere. So y'all try not to scratch yourself, man, take care of yourself, because the aneurysm come out of anywhere. Coop was healthy. That was very unexpected. Very. Sad, I'm sorry for your loss uh, once again. Yeah, rest in peace, Coop. My son asked me the other day, Mom, do you think about Coop still? I said, yeah, I always think about Coop. I think about Coop, I think about Lord, I think about a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, then at one point, 3-6 Mafia kind of came back together as the Mafia 6. Yeah. How, how did that feel to kind of get everyone back, you know, get the gang all back together? Uh, it felt like we never left because we all grew up together. You know, we all was a part of each other's childhood. Like I always say, at some point, everybody was gone. But at the same time, we all, is who we are. It came back, everybody was still the same. Paul was still like he was. Boo was still like she was. Lloyd, Crunchy, Coop, and me. We still was the same. It felt good. Good energy, great energy. Well, Juicy J wasn't actually part of that, which is why it wasn't called 3-6 Mafia, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, Juicy wasn't part of it. Okay. As someone who got brought in by Juicy J, why do you think Juicy wasn't part of it? Uh, I, I really don't know. You know, I think he had so much other stuff going on then at the same time, you know. I think he just was being juicy. He was just being juicy. <laughs> he was still being, you know, juicy. I wish yeah. he would have been juicy, a part I of really it. Know. I think we did like one interview. I wish he would have been a part yeah. of it, you know, but hey, I, I got to see him when we did the little tour dates. I was excited. Right, because Paul and Juicy did start doing some shows together as 3 Six Mafia, which was big. Yeah. Yeah. Because they love one another. Regardless, you know, they they like real brothers. Keep in mind, these folks was 12, 13 years old and up to now. You know, everybody fall out, everybody they look wrongs or whatever, but their love don't never go nowhere. You know, you get people that be married and break up and come back together, get remarried. And that's what it is. You know, we gonna always love each other. I don't care what nobody say. I don't care how many interviews they do and say whatever they say. Like I said, I ain't taking nobody's side. If that's how they feel, that's how they feel. At the end of the day, we all love each other. That love is never going to go nowhere. Yeah, and it's really kind of, you know, really amazing how many people have sampled 3-6 Mafia, have redone their songs, have quoted them, uh, have, have chopped up parts of their beats. You know, I mean... It, it's gotten redone so many times. I mean, I would almost say that Three Six Mafia could be the most influential group in hip hop in terms of the sound. Yeah, the industry ain't gonna let us separate no way. Because <laughs> the more that they keep doing it, the more we keep bringing us together. You know, people be booking shows, they ask about this person, that person. So we're gonna eventually end up, even if we try not to come around each other, we're gonna eventually end up seeing each other because they know we in the same area. They know. This person go with this person, this person go with this person. Nobody else that they really can put with us but us. Yeah. There, there you go. And I there won three go. six mafia. I was hypnotized count passes, which was a difference. But you know, I still was there. Three six mafia was built on um Boo, Paul, Juicy J, Coop, Lord, and Crunchy. And then I came along, they had White, they had Frazier, you had Pat. And Human Task Camp Posse was the whole label, so they was like the group of the label, but we still all Human Task Camp Posse. Yeah. Right, and that's why I said, you know, I mean, even though you weren't technically in the actual six-person group, you were part of the whole camp and you were part of the whole sound. Yeah. And you were on very, very important songs along the way. Yeah. So, so that's why I kind of said it that way. Well, I had interviewed Crunchy Black recently, and he had mentioned that his son and your son were arrested together for guns? Once upon a time, uh, my son, Darion, uh, Bizzle Boy Black, that's his rap name, Darion, is his name that we gave him, but Bizzle Boy Black is my oldest son. And Lil' Chat's son 
end up pulling up at uh, a McDonald's. I think it was a Wendy. Hold up. Just like they, like Kodak did. But them young niggas had their guns on their side. My son and little chat son had their guns on the side and the girl saw the gun. She called the police, the police come and take her to jail because they had guns and shit. The chat son is still in jail right now. My oh. son, yeah, the chat son is still in jail. Duke, free Duke, uh, free Duke, the chat son. And uh, my son is out of jail trying to, you know, keep this rap shit going. Yeah. Everybody in Memphis got guns. So, you know, it wasn't, nothing but, it wasn't, it wasn't a big idea. Okay. Uh, do you end up doing any prison time over that, or is it just a slap on the wrist? Well, what it was, it was just like a, something that he didn't do. You know, I knew that he didn't do it. He got into some little trouble. I fought it to get him out of it, and we beat it, and I brought him home. Oh, so he actually beat the case? Yeah, he beat all his cases. <laughs> That's what's up. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's up. I mean... Being the environment that you came from and seeing some of the things that you've seen and experiencing some of the things that you experienced, did you try to make sure your son doesn't get, you know, mixed up in the streets or is it, well, listen, he's a, he's a man. I can't really do nothing at this man, point. Man, I tried so hard, but once again, you know, he was our only child. He got bored. You see what I'm saying? And then you got me on the road and you got me being hard on him. You know, his father was locked up growing up and I'm trying to keep my foot on his neck at the same time and do the music and he's the only child and you know he end up being in the streets turning to the streets but he's still a good good you know young man he got his high school diploma he still did what he's supposed to do in life and he's still doing what he's supposed to be doing so the trouble ain't none that's Memphis I don't know now nigga or now I said me I ain't never been to jail let me not go with you know, but I don't know no too many other people in Memphis that ain't, you know, getting no trouble. That what happened. Yeah. Well, and then uh, last year, Crunchy Black loses his daughter in a, in a murder that happened uh, in Memphis once again, Southeast Memphis. Um, when you heard that news, how'd you feel? I felt sad because once again, I'm a parent. I'm a mother. And, and it's devastating, you know, rather... He lived in Memphis or not, that still was a part of him. And I, I, I heard it for him, I hated it for him, and it was sad, especially the way it happened, it was just sad, you know. Rest in peace to her too, prayers for the family still, cause you know, that's something that you never, never forget, it never heals, it never goes away. Even though you try to keep going on with life, I know, I know, like I said, I just follow my son and he alive, so, just imagine losing a, a child. It hurts. It's pain. Yeah. I mean, it was shortly after we did our first interview. So our next interview, we, we discussed it. And, um, you know, Crunchy tried to put on as brave of a face as he could, but you could tell how much it was, it was killing him inside. Man, especially you know, for it to be sad. a daughter, you know. No, no man oh, yeah. want to lose their daughter. Every man really want to be their protector in uh, so many ways, you know. So I know. I understand. We understand, Crunch. Yeah. 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 Very, 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 very sad, man. Like, I, yeah, we, we spoke to him about it a couple of times, and you could tell he's just trying to to just get by the best he can at this point, but it's it's killing him inside. Yeah, it is. It is. Crunch love his children. He love all his children. Like I yeah. said, once again, we was just on the road a lot, and we was doing music, and sometimes that, that makes you get distance from your kids. You know, then they grow up and they get into stuff that we don't expect them to get into. They be around people that we don't expect them to be around. But at the same time, our kids got their own mind. We could tell them don't do this. They going to tell us they ain't going to do it. But at the same time, they going to do what they want to do. You know what I'm saying? But then when they get in their trouble, we're going to be the ones to come get them out of it. When they get, die, we're going to be the ones to bury them. It, it, it never goes away. We're going to forever be a parent. You know, I don't, my story is not my son's trouble. I don't talk about the trouble. He's been in a lot of trouble. I don't talk about it because it's not my story. To me, you know, people that get on talking about jail or doing interviews, that's clout chasing. That's nothing to be bragging about. There's nothing to be talking about. 
there's pain, there's struggle, there's the real life issues, things that you want to get behind you and keep moving on. Talk about what he's doing now. You know, yeah, he got a little trouble, but guess what? He working a job now. He got a car. He doing good. You know, he got his head on right. That's what my son doing. There and you so have is it. Crunchy's well, son, Bezel boy. So, <laughs> First of all, oh, yeah. my son Duke, I got to shout him out. Shout out Duke. And shout out Bezel boy. Bezel boy rapping now. So, you know, they got their head on right. It's, oh, well, let's not talk about the old uh, Duke and Bezel boys. These folks grown. They on their grown man shit. There you have it. There you have it. Well, the chat, I appreciate you finally, you know, sitting down and doing our interview. Thank um, you. You know, I've been a big fan for a long time. You guys have had so much influence on music as a whole. And, you know, as you can see by these memes and, you know, people like Cardi B remaking songs and, and so forth that you guys, you know, the whole Hypnotized Minds camp was so influential and so important to hip hop as a whole. And as an artist, I think the most important thing is to create something that lives on after our lifetimes. And I know that for sure what you have created will live on way past, you know, the time that you and I aren't going to be around anymore. Man, it's amazing to be still getting booked. It's amazing that people still buy verses and get features. You know, it's amazing that we still get called for interviews because like I said, I'm happily 43. You know what I'm saying? So I've been doing this since I was 12, 13 years old, and I'm still making money off of it. So, you know, it's amazing. And we thank y'all for loving us. We thank y'all for supporting us. We thank y'all for letting us be us. Because we didn't make it up. We didn't do nothing but be us. That's all we did. We just came in and been us. So we thank y'all for allowing us to do that. Absolutely. Wish you all the best. Let's chat. Until next time. Peace.